let's all turn, let's, let's just start in Jonah. We won't be there for the beginning of tonight, but let's turn to Jonah, since we are studying the minor prophets. And uh, it's good to be back, believe it or not. <laughs> There's a point that you've got to get back, but it's, it's nice to be back um, and see lovely faces again. Are you in the right room? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know, there's new faces on Wednesday night in summer. You go look around and go, oh, a one is in here. <laughs> so, all right, so Jonah chapter, th- well, we'll start with two and go to three. So, um, and then we're going to go to Matthew and Luke and just kind of think about certain things. I was telling a group of people Monday, we Christians are a group of people that we need to learn that we always think, and we're always thinking about things, and we always uh, constantly need to be thinking, but we need to be thinking God's thoughts after Him. Uh, there are some groups that just parrot other people, and we don't want to parrot. We want to hear what God has to say, so since that's what we're doing, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You, again, that we can come together as a body of believers not only to look into your word, to hear from you, to, to uh, get guidance from you, but to know that you're a God who loves us, a God who cares for us extremely and, and has shown it in a variety of ways. And as we spend time in the book of Jonah, uh, your love for this uh, disgruntled uh, prophet is amazing, but at the same time, your hand upon him and the use of him for, for a fantastic uh, a sign and a, and a reason that he was used Father, is is an example for all of us today, that even in the smallest things, you're there. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the ability to have a building that has AC in it, and we can get out of the heat a little bit. We thank you for this time, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, We kind of left off a couple weeks ago in the midst of Jonah, well, we ended with Jonah's prayer, but I kind of gave you some thoughts going into verse 3. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and I, what I want to pick up with tonight, here's what I want to do, and kind of this is the direction I'd like to head, is I want to talk a little bit about where we are in Jonah, then we're going to talk about a little bit how Jesus used Jonah and talked about the, the sign of Jonah was what the Jews were going to get, and then we'll prayerfully by that time we'll get into a little bit of the difference between the pagan gods of Jonah's time and our God, because I still think as we look around us, the pagan gods are worshipped, and we just don't call them pagan gods. They are things that people worship, that they elevate above God. So we will go in that direction. So I want to look at is the end of chapter 2, verse 9, where it says, salvation is from the Lord. Um, There are certain statements in the Bible, and I've said this before, that are so loaded by the time you un- ravel them, you would have probably gone from Genesis to Revelation. But to say salvation is from the Lord in the midst of the situation Jonah was in, dealing with the pagans on the boat, being thrown into the the ocean, being swallowed up by a fish, and in the midst, either in the midst of the fish or in the midst of the ocean, sometime he prayed this prayer. We're really not going to be too dogmatic about it. We know he prayed the prayer, but he understood by the end of the prayer that salvation is from the Lord. And that's a pretty heavy statement because not only was he looking for physical deliverance from the water or the fish whenever the prayer occurred, but he understood that his, his ultimate salvation is from the Lord, no matter what, where he ended up with and in. Um, remember from the mist of the fish or the mist of the water, he talked about being in the pit, being in the grave, being at the very threshold of death, um, I don't think he feared death, but he knew where he was at because he knew salvation was from the Lord. And I think that's one thing uh, as we pivot to chapter 3. Here's a neat thing about Jonah. If you take chapter 1 and chapter 3, you, you see a very uh, disgruntled, you see a, a guy that's f- almost forced to do what he's going to do as an instrument of God. But you take chapter 2 and chapter 4, and it's like, Wow, he really has it all together in some parts of chapter 4. We'll look at that. Uh, he's an up and down kind of guy. But, but we see that these, they're, they're kind of bookend chapters, how they deal with that. One minute Jonah's up, and one minute Jonah's down. Um, I kind of called him a disobedient prophet or a disgruntled prophet. Or dis, but 
as we look at this, he's just being used by God, and God is going to teach us all a wonderful lesson out of that. So we go to verse 10, it says, Then the Lord commanded the fish. What a neat, you know, we're talking about neat things. And that's a really neat thing, because salvation is from the Lord, and then God commands a fish. I've been fishing, I don't know how many times. I've never said, oh, fish, jump in the boat. Oh, fish, swallow my hook. I've seen some massive bass just roll right by me. I said, I can grab you, and my bait is like, don't you see this thing? Um, I've had that happen. Uh, But God commands a fish. I don't know if we would even consider a fish commandable. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, you took a look at animal in the animal worlds, uh, how many uh, animals are tamed and given directions, but fish, um, it's an iffy thing. You know, as they say, well, dolphins can and, and whales can, but they're not called fish. They're what? They're, they're mammals. So there's different species. So... But if we look at this, the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up on the dry land. And one of the things we said when we got to that is it was probably the starting place where Jonah had left dry land to go into the water. It's probably Joppa because the very next verse, and, and we have problems usually in our English Bibles with chapters and verse breaks. And here's one of those things because it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. So where Jonah's at is probably the similar place that he got the first message. And God's saying, Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a second chance. How many chances does God give people? Multiple chances. And we, we always get, Why does God give Jonah a second chance? Really? You know, we, we will see that Jonah gets a second chance. And God will give him a directive. But I don't want to go there right here this evening. I want to kind of shift gears for a second. And I want to talk to you from Matthew. So hold your finger if we get back to Jonah. But go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And Jesus uses um, the book of Jonah, which makes it even that much better. So we know that Jonah is part of Scripture because Jesus is going to refer to it. Oh, I like that voice. A little one. There she is. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. See? Even when they're little, they cry when I talk. <laughs> Matthew chapter 12. Um, it, it, really interesting here. Now, now we're going to get in the mid, midst of a conversation he has with the Pharisees. And once you say that Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees, it's just a bad situation. The Pharisees are always doing what to Jesus? What are they trying to do to Jesus? Okay, what would we call that? Entrap him or a test? They're trying to test him. And when they, when they test him, they always when, within that test, they ask him a question so he could pass the test or ask him to do something. Okay? Now, if you're, if you're with the flow of history, you know Jesus has been doing a lot of things. Okay, and if you look, if you, uh, Travis did a great job on Thursday nights. I, I, man, if you haven't listened to Travis's last three lessons, go get them on John. They're really good. Um, but in the book of John, John's gospel is built around signs and wonders, the miracles, whether you call them seven miracles or eight or nine, uh, depends on how you do your counting. It's around those signs that Jesus is doing in the gospel of John. So the, These guys have seen this. There's been a lot of conversation about who Jesus is. Even Herod and Pilate know he has a track record of doing, as far as they're concerned, tricks. Okay? So when we get to chapter uh, 12, verse 38, we're, we're well into the time period. Now, if you know your Gospel of Matthew, by the time we get to chapter 13, he's no longer talking to the Jews. The Jews have formally kind of rejected him. He's going to talk to them only in parables. So you know where we're going. So we get chapter 12, verse 38, and that said, Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, the sarcastic side of me pulls up saying, "Uh, Haven't you seen the YouTube videos? (laughs) Where have you been? Um... Which is interesting because this group of Pharisees, and if you want to tie it in, I'm going to kind of bang off of some of the stuff Travis did. 
And Nicodemus might have been part of this. This group of people that were questioning Jesus. And uh, Joseph of Arimathea probably was there too. Or not this group that was questioning necessarily, but they were the Pharisees, the leaders at the time. The Pharisees at the time are called, are equated to the Jews of John. So when you see when it says the Jews question him, it's not the whole Jewish people. Could you imagine that kind of questioning? Everybody from the whole populace came and said, we want to ask you a question. It's the Jewish leaders. These represented the people. Okay, with me so far. This is kind of really, uh, the scribes re- re- uh, represented the side of the law. They understood the law. They were the interpreters of the law. We would call them the uh, lawyers of the day. The guys that passed the bar. So we had the Pharisees who kind of imposed the laws. And the scribes who made sure they were followed. So they're going to ask Jesus to give us a sign. Um, when you go to Scripture, always ask yourself questions. Why do they want a sign? Why do they want a sign? Anybody got an answer? Possibly. Why else? I mean, that's probably part of it. I mean, pardon me? They possibly. I don't think, I don't, I don't know if I see that sometimes. That's all. I, I want to believe that myself, but. Go back further. No. In order for the Jew to know their Messiah was coming, he would come with signs and wonders. So if he's really the Messiah, he'll do uh, like the magic genie effect. When, when we ask him, he'll perform. We usually go to a circus to see that happen, don't we? Do this for me. Um, they want to see a sideshow. Now, here's the funny thing in the, in the language that you really got to grasp. It, they're not asking him, we want to see a sign. It's kind of in the language like, we wish for you to give us a sign. And we're wishing all the time. So it's a, it's a constant wishing. Yet, yet the word sign is in the singular mode. Yet it's presently being asked, constantly being asked. So what they're basically saying is, we want to see a sign now. We want to see a sign again. We want to see a sign again. So what would you say? They want to say different kinds of signs As many times as he can perform them. So what are they asking for? Like a sideshow. Isn't it kind of, that's the feeling you kind of get. But however, we're in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew is not necessarily in chronological order. But we do see if you kind of layer the gospels together, Jesus has performed a lot of signs already. And they've seen them. There isn't many signs he really had to do to prove it. Hey, if you read somebody from the dead... You got me on board. You heal the blind and the lame. You got me on board. Isn't that what Isaiah is talking about? About the Messiah coming. He will heal the lame and the blind. And they shall see. They shall walk. Okay. They've had that many times. We don't even know what kind of sign they want. Which is interesting. Because they're using a word that kind of says. This is going to point to who the man is. So yes they kind of say. Do a sign so we could believe you the Messiah. But I don't think they wanted to believe. They wanted to disbelieve. You remember, they, they, they kind of want a Messiah in their own making. What do they want? They want a guy that will destroy and wreck and ro- ruin Rome's uh, oppression over them. And Jesus came to d- die on the cross first. There would be a cross before a crown. They want to put the crown on him already, if he is, but they don't. Because we know that they, they reject him as a whole. Do people believe? Yeah, absolutely. But I think this group, as we're doing this, um, kind of think how you would answer people when they ask you, well, let's put it in our day and age. Somebody's going to walk up to you and say, can you prove to me Jesus is really the Messiah? Would you answer them, verse 39? Verse 39 says, you, an evil and adulterous generation... Craze for a sign. You have? What kind of eyes did you get like that? You're like, what? Um, this is not um, what we would call a very nice Christian answer. What Jesus knows, and of course he's being God, knows deeper than we would know. But um, 
if you think about it, people crave certain signs. People like to see the miraculous. I know about you. I like to see the miraculous. Uh, how many of you really like a good magician once in a while? That's really, truly a magician, not kind of goofy. Um, there's some the magicians you go, how did, how did you do that? Because you know there's a trick. You know he did that. Um, I, I'm kind of a, a semi-fan of America's Got Talent. And there was one guy that did a card trick, and he went over to a seat like here and cut open the seat and ripped the seat open, and there's the card inside the seat. And you go, oh, you got to show me how you did that. You know, that was the card they were looking at. I'm going, no, no, no. There's, I know there's a trick, but I like it. That was pretty cool. But that's not a sign to anything um, spiritual happening. It was just entertainment. And it, it had me. I said, he wins. <laughs> um, but he didn't. Uh, however... Um, What's fascinating, though, and this is what you got to put in perspective, because here's what Jesus says. He says, yet no sign will be given to you but the sign of Jonah the prophet. Here's the fascinating thing. Let's put it in perspective. Jesus, along with the signs, also had a message. They didn't ask, can we hear more from you speaking the word? Can we hear more about the enlightenment you got to bring us? Can we hear more? Because I'm telling you, if you want to see some really great sermons, read your New Testament. (laughs) Jesus had a few of them, right? Some fantastic sermons because it got cut to the quick because he's he understands people's nature. But they didn't ask him for more of the word. They wanted more of the tricks. And I'm, I'm, I know that's not the same word. I understand that. But, but that's kind of where they're at. And when Jesus says the only sign you're going to get is because you are an adulteress. Kind of keep this in mind. An adulteress and evil generation. Now let's kind of just talk about those two words before we go to Luke for a second. Because he says similar things in Luke. And the times he says this in Luke and in Mark, I believe they're not the same times. So he doesn't say this once. Kind of think about that for a minute. Kind of nails it home, doesn't it? They're an evil generation. What does that kind of bring to light to you? They're evil. The what? Our generation. <laughs> that kind of, I think that's a lot of generations. But when the word evil comes to you in the Bible, and, and from this perspective, what are you saying? Or what are you thinking as far as these people are? Huh? Well, it says, it says adulterous, which is close. We'll see why it's... Idolatrous and adulterous are closer than evil, but evil's what? Huh? Evil's bad, yeah, I like that. <laughs> really bad, bad. Um, evil is sin taken to the nth degree. Evil is sin out of control. What do you expect out of an evil generation? Tell me, just say it, say it right back at me. Evil. It's sin to the nth degree. Yes, we can kind of apply it to our generation right now, but you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing. Remember, when God flooded the earth in Noah's time, it was evil to the nth degree. And now it's evil because why? He came unto his own, and his own was rejecting him. That is evil. And he puts it together with a word that's adulterous. That means they have left their love for another. Think about it for a minute. They have left their, their love, their true husband... They're, they're one in the flesh kind of idea for another. Who have they left it for? Their own ideals, their own opinions. Gods of their own making. The Pharisees had taken what was truly holy and just and right, the law, and added to it man's thoughts, man's opinions. And it made it over a burden upon people. And Jesus addresses that. You've made it so burdensome nobody could possibly even bear the weight you've put upon them. Really? That's evil and adulterous generation. And the only sign they deserved that generation was a sign of Jonah. Keep that in mind for a minute. Because they've already had other signs. But we are at the stage now where Jesus is shutting down his ministry to the people, of the people, the populace. And he's going to deal mostly with his disciples. Because we'll see in chapter... Well, I'm not going to go to chapter 13. But if you want to read chapter 13, he says, I'm talking to you. You guys are going to get this. The rest... Well, they'll have to get it explained to them, and they may not get it anyway when he talks in parables. So um, go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11.
Now, this is in the midst of him doing a trick. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm losing that loosely. Please don't walk out of here and think I, Jesus is a trickster or a magician. But Jesus did something really wonderful. It says in verse 14, 11, 14, And he was casting out a demon, and it, and it was dumb. And it came about when the demon had gone out of him, the dumb man spoke, and the multitudes marveled. What's the result of a sign? People marvel. What, what's that mean? It means, who is this guy? How does he do this? Well, there was an answer to how he did this in verse 15. I don't agree with it, and neither should you. But it said, some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. And the first thing you've got to say is, do these people really have their brain together? <laughs> really? Really? I mean, just think about that. The ruler of Beelzebub is going to cast out his own minions... To do what with them? Why? Why would he do that? Wouldn't he want them to be taking over? Okay? And and to me that just shows the the mockery, the the lostness of these people. It's basically the thing I can come up with. It's the lostness. Because it says, And others, listen, verse 16, And others, to test him, were demanding him a sign from heaven. Wait! Well, hello? Hello? You just cast out demons... And what, he, what they're asking basically for is something to come down out of the sky be brought forth. To see something come down. You just cast out a demon. These, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something as nice as I can. People that are blind often show their blindness by opening their mouth. You understand what I'm saying? And they're opening their mouth and they're saying things like, what? Are you, re- are you really watching what's going on? Are you getting any of this? And, but he knew their thoughts, because guess what? They didn't say this out loud. And the first thing they should have thought of when he said the next statement is, uh-oh, he knows what I'm thinking. Is that a sign to you? That's a sign to me. But they were looking for the big. And sometimes we look for the big and don't realize that the person in the pew is a miracle because they've been brought to the Lord and they're saved. And we miss those. We want to see a miracle. Look around you. We're all miracles. But in verse 17, he says, But he knew their thoughts. Any kingdom divided against himself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. In other words, if Satan was really casting out Satan, or Beelzebub in this case, his demons, he'd just fall apart. What kind of ruler is that? Now, drop down for a second and go with me to verse 29, and we'll come back. Verse 29, we're still in Luke. And as the crowds were increasing, that's a good thing for most pastors, crowds are increasing. What are we going to do? How, what's, what's the first sermon that's going to come out of your mouth? This generation is wicked. <laughs> I don't know if that works real well for the dominions. It says, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for sign, and yet no sign shall be given it but the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah came, uh, came, became a sign to, to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man uh, be to this generation. So Jesus understands the, the narrative that happened and occurred with Jonah and the Ninevites. And he says, I am going to be, that's the only sign you're going to get. Because all you, all, you, all you deserve at this point of where you're at spiritually is one sign. I will give you one sign. And I think it is so fascinating as we tie these things together to see that one sign was meant for all to know for sure he is who he claimed to be. No one else can, can handle that one sign. No one else can come across with that one sign. Um, here's the interesting thing, though, as we're kind of walking through this. A believer sees a sign as authentication. I don't need more signs. I know Jesus is Jesus. And as I read through the, the narratives of the Gospels, I'm just saying, oh, oh, fantastic. That, yeah, I expected that. Oh, yeah. I, I even say sometimes uh, flippantly to, to, to an audience, I say, there was no doctors in Jerusalem. Jesus healed everybody wherever he walked. Now, that's not necessarily true, but that's the kind of flavor you should get because Luke is a writer of the gospel, and he was what? A do- no, he's an out-of-business doctor that decided to become a historian because he, that's how I always look at it because it kind of works. But I don't know. But I I just know when Jesus healed people, even a lady who reached out and grabbed the hem of his garment was healed. That's the power he had at that time. Dead people raised. And I said, yep, I expected dead people to be raised. 
Because why? He's the Son of God in human flesh, and He's come to become the Messiah. I have no problem with that. But you know, the unbeliever seeks a sign to be entertained. So keep those two thoughts together. One is for authentication, and one is for, hey, sideshow. Isn't that kind of how Herod comes across when John the Baptist is there? Bring him in. I want to see what he can do. You know? Really? Um, And that's kind of where a lot of people are at. Look at verse 16, though. Go back to Luke chapter 11. We're still in Luke 11, but verse 16. Um, I really want to hit home on this because it says, others to test him. To test him. Or, or would be saying in the, in the tense they they were constantly testing him. That means when they opened their mouth in their, the way they addressed the Lord, it, it was in the form of a test. What does the Bible say about testing God? Do not test the Lord thy God. Don't put him to the test. Uh, so you can kind of see when he talks about an evil and adulterous generation what they were doing. They were putting the Lord to a test. Um, I almost think it's irony how man gets that they, he will test God instead of allowing God to test him. Look how many times the Bible talks about us testing ourselves, yet we want to put God to the test. And we do that. Many of us make kind of a little agreements with God. God, if you do this, I'll do this. You ever heard anybody doing that? Come on, we've all done it. We've all done it at some point in our lives. Lord, if I spend more time with you, um, make my time more available, make this happen to me, help, allow this to come on, and we, we kind of test God. Instead of saying, Lord, I'm just going to do this because this is what you want me to do. We want to see the outcome. Look at Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. Speaking of the unbeliever side that they want to see a show it says um luke 23 verse 8 it says and herod was very glad that he saw jesus now just stop there for a second why would herod be very glad he saw jesus and most of us would say well he saw the lord he was it was so precious that he was allowed to be in the messiah's very presence I mean, that's what we, if we stop right there, that's what most of us would think. But it doesn't say that. It says, it goes on, for, for he had wanted him to see him for a long time because he was hearing about him and was hoping, wishing, wanting, it's the same idea, wishing to see some sign performed by him. Bring him in and he could be along with the, you know, let's see, the court gestures will come before him and the court dancers after him and then Jesus will come in the midst of them and do something really neat. You know, and that's the kind of flavor you get out of that, don't you? Or is it just mind wild imagination? Um, verse 9 says, and he questioned him at some length and he, he answered, listen, This is the perfect opportunity. We're going to have a moment. We're going to have a missionary moment. Let's bring the missionary moment from verse 9 of Luke 23. Jesus said nothing. Do you find a problem with that? See, the Lord knew at this point He wasn't going to get what He wanted. He wasn't going to be uh, persuaded in any fashion. Because you know what the fascinating thing is? Signs don't persuade anybody. Think about this for a minute. Signs do not persuade anybody. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? Signs? By the Word of God. So if he wants to see signs, what is he going to get? Nothing. Isn't that kind of neat? Imagine you go, having this wonderful missionary moment. Somebody says, man, if, if Jesus was here and he did this, I'd believe. And know what you need to answer him? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. And know what Jesus would do for you? He would be silent in your very presence. And be very careful when God is silent. Just think about it for a minute. The silence of God should scare you. And that's what's what's happening here, I think, more than anything. Um, Look what happens in the next verse, just so you know where we're going, because this is in the midst of these wonderful trials. Um, Verse 10 says, Then chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently, and Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. There was not a seeking of who this guy could be. 
uh, not an interest of who he was, but just to carry out an injustice in the middle of the night. And just in case, during the midst of the injustice, I could see something kind of neat, let me do it. Now remember, Herod's a puppet king anyway, who is standing before the very king of kings, lord of lords. Kind of vision that for a minute. And he's asking the Lord, give me a sign. Put on a show for us. Matthew chapter 11. Let's get the opposite opinion. The opposite idea of what happens when, this, when someone sees a sign. Matthew chapter 11 verse 1. You know what the interesting thing is, and and I'm not trying to overstep, but but Travis got me thinking a little bit about John. Most of the time, it talks about a sign in John. They were already believers when the sign was given. Think about that minute. You see a sign, and they're already believers. John chapter nine talks about the man born blind. And he was he was done it before his who his disciples. There was one that wasn't a believer, but most of them were believers. Uh, verse John, uh, Matthew chapter 11, sidetrack for a second, verse 1, And it came about when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his twelve disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. So notice the formula that's involved. Jesus is going to do signs, wonders, and miracles. No, what does it say? He's going to do what? Teach and preach. If you don't know what teach and preach is, that means teach, say it again, and explain it. Teach, say it again, and explain it. I'm sure his delivery was a thousand times better than mine because he had it down. But this is what he was doing. He was using words. Now, when John, when John was in prison, he heard the works of Christ, Messiah. He sent word by his disciples. So John the Baptist is in prison, and he wants to know what's going on. John the Baptist is Jesus is what? cousin it's a relative how long had he known jesus he knew of him at least his entire life more than likely we know in the womb he jumped i don't i don't know if it was mom carrying the emotion or or i think it is john the baptist the 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 baby in utero reacting to another baby in utero but that's for another time but it says, um, verse 3, and he said to him, are you the expected one? Are, are you the, the Messiah? Are you the um, coming one, I guess is the best. Now, remember, the Jews always thought of the Messiah was the one that would come with the, with the rod of Judah, the, the Shiloh, to, to bring all victory back to Israel. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what they were looking for. They didn't understand the first advent from the second advent. So what he's looking for, are you the, the one coming? Okay? Or should we look for someone else? That's a very valid answer. Does G, John the Baptist understand Jesus is the Lamb of God? Please say yes, because he said that in John chapter 1. He understands he's the Lamb of God. He doesn't understand the eschaton of this Messiah. Remember, by this time in Jewish society, there was at least two messiahs. Messiah ben David, who would come to rule and reign, and Messiah ben Joseph, who would suffer. Some of them had that dichotomy. They didn't realize it was in one. So this is what gets explained. Jesus said, and go report to John what you hear, what you hear, the words first, and then what you see. Please don't separate those. Because the next thing he says to him is called Scripture. He repeats to him Scripture. Even though this has has to be carried out by the Messiah, and this is what he's referring to, he says, verse 5, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. So all of that there, he told him from the old uh, Hebrew scriptures about the Messiah that this is happening. This is happening, John. And as they were going about their way, Jesus began to speak to the multitudes about John. 
Notice what he said. Here's his, here's his report about John, so you know, to a believer, it was given Jesus the authentication, because this is what he says about John. What did you go into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But why did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, I say to you, and the one who is more than a prophet, for it is written about uh, whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So what he's saying is, John is the... uh, way preparer, the road paver. That's who John was. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, which I don't think I would ever say about anybody. And Jesus could say this about John. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, which guess who that is? That's, I think that's everybody. I don't know. It must, must, might have been a test tube happening in three weeks. I wasn't around. But of everybody born to women, there has not one risen greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now what he's saying is, John is number one, but I am who I am. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Isn't that, isn't that a kind of a fascinating thing? So signs... Um, at this time, and, I, and I'm going to kind of jump in here, I'm going to go back to where Travis was just for a few minutes because I want to reiterate something a little differently than Travis did, so go to John chapter 2. And, and what I'm saying is the Lord works neat because I really didn't know what Travis was totally doing, and Travis didn't know where I was going, so that's, this is kind of works really good. So John chapter 2. My focus is on the signs. John chapter 2, verse 18. Now, my Bible's kind of marked up so you can see where I'm going. Just look at this for a second. You can see these lines all drawn because it's all connected. So I'm going to show you how it's connected. If I, I don't know if I could... I wish I had one of those... Les Feldick used to do it, right? He used to show the... So that might be really cool for this. this is, um, verse 18 starts out, the Jews. <laughs> um, put an air in your mind, the Pharisees. Now, what were we saying? The Pharisees are not believers. They're looking for what? What do unbelievers look for? The sign of...